In the Living Bible, which I've told you before is my favorite, I'm going to read just for my own reading. It says this, it says, since we have a kingdom that nothing can destroy, let us please God by serving Him with thankful hearts. Serving Him with thankful hearts. Man, y'all know I want to preach that, and God knows I'm going to preach that this morning, but serving Him with thankful hearts and with a holy fear and awe. In the English Standard Version, it says, Therefore, let us be grateful. You hear thankfulness, now you hear gratitude, now you hear grateful. Let us, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. And then in the message, it simply says this, it says, Do you see what we've gotten? An unshakable kingdom. And do you see how thankful we must be. Like it doesn't give us an option, right, to choose it. So often we think, well, we, you, 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 even myself and other preachers say, you know, we, we, just, we just need to choose to be thankful. Really, it ought not be a choice. When you look around you, when you see all that God has done, man, it ought to just pour out of us. Do you see how Thankful we must be, not only thankful, but breathing with worship, being deeply reverent before God. May God add his blessing to the reading of all those translations of his word. I want to share with you a story, if I can, out of the book. Uh, it's a book called Looking for God. The author is Nancy Orbert. And she says this in this book. She says, I worked as a registered nurse for about 10 years before my life took a different direction. One of my earliest patients was a young girl of about 14 who had been in a dirt bike accident. She said, I met this young girl uh, down in the physical therapy department. She was in a whirlpool back. And she said, as I read her chart before I went down to work with her and, and had learned what, what, what was the result of an accident, uh, of the, I'm sorry, before I went down, I read her chart and I realized uh, that as a result of her accident, her leg had been amputated below the knee. And she said, I couldn't imagine what it must be like for a 14-year-old girl with part of your leg missing. So I introduced myself to her and we made some small talk. And actually through the course of our small amount of time together, I learned that she was a follower of Christ, although she really didn't say much about that. I just learned that about her and could sense that about her. And then she said, I was not prepared for her spirit, especially when she lifted her freshly amputated leg out of the bubbling water for me to see it and said, look. And how much I had left. She excitedly told me that since the doctors were able to amputate below the knee, it was much easier to fit a prosthesis. And she wondered how long it would take to heal so that she could go ahead and hurry up and get started with that process. I heard most of what she was saying, but I really wasn't paying attention, if I'm honest, because my mind was fixed back on this statement, look how much is left. She said her gratitude seemed really genuine. It wasn't denial or a Pollyanna mentality. She knew she was missing a good part of her leg and she wouldn't have chosen that. But she was so very thankful for this bit of good news in, in, in spite of the bad that her spirit made my spirit soar that day. And, and that I had made me thankful that I had two good legs. She said, I don't think it was by accident that that night my Bible study included Hebrews chapter 12 verse 28 where it says... Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and worship God. She, she goes on to write, she said, our gratitude and our thankfulness, whether we understand it or not, whether we uh, comprehend it or not, our attitude, our gratitude, our thankfulness is the way in which we worship God. Yes, we can sing, and that is worship. We can, we can say thank you, and that is worship. And we can give, and that is worship. And we can serve, and that is worship. And she said, and, and on that day, I realized, on that day in the hospital, the gratitude of a 14-year-old girl moved me to understand how much my thankfulness, my gratitude, is my worship. She said, to the point of making one of my goals in life 
to have the same type of attitude as that girl. How inspiring to witness such an outpouring of gratitude in difficult circumstances. Look how much I have left. It's convicting, is it not? As I read that story, very much convicted in my own mind. And, uh, sometimes how little, I, I probably realized how little, I'm sorry, that's just going to distract me the whole time, but I'm sure. <laughs> I don't know how we got up here. Anyone bandy must have brought it with him. Um, <laughs> I, I realized how how sometimes it's it's just happy, right? It's just always happy. It's never happy. And so the Bible tells us what we already know and what we've just talked about in this illustration. The Bible tells us that we we should give thanks to God for His many blessings. And we are able to do that no matter what situation we find ourselves in. No matter what's going on around us. No matter what amount of chaos or, or destruction or, or, or fear or unknowns. No, no, no amount of, of want. No amount of plenty. Should be able to keep us from focusing on this aspect of worship. Right? You know, if, if you're worshiping and singing, you've got to have a few elements to worship and singing. Right? You have to have a song in your heart. You have to have a voice that you can use. Right? You have to have a heart that creates melody. If we're doing it in a corporate setting, you know, we need somebody to kind of lead us and we need words if we don't know the song and whatever, right? But the worship of Thanksgiving, we don't need anything for. The worship of thanksgiving, the worship of giving thanks back to God, we don't need anything for it other than just a, a, a self-awareness or a realization where we can set ourselves aside, our whining, our complaining, our, our doubts, our, all those things. We don't, just to get rid of those things and to be able to just worship God by being thankful. And here's the truth, right? We forget that far too often. We, 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 we fall prey to what this world wants us to be. The world wants us to be miserable. We're sharing with you good that you're going through Romans 12 on Wednesday night. And the world wants to control their mind and their thoughts. That's why it's so important that it says be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because the world wants you to be miserable. The world doesn't want you to be happy. This world system which Satan controls, it wants you to compare. It wants you on Instagram looking at how great everybody else's life is. It wants you on TikTok trying to do those dances and all those things that other people do. It wants you on Facebook so that you're comparing. It wants you to be miserable. It, it wants you to think that you're missing out. If you don't have a fancy car, if you don't have a giant house, it wants you to think you're missing out. You know why it wants you to think that? Because you'll never be thankful for what you have if you're always worried about what you're missing. It's nothing new. Remember back in Genesis? They could have everything in the garden. I'm scared you leave it in the you don't like it when I get by. I don't know why she's up front. <laughs> they could have everything in the garden. But they weren't thankful enough for all of everything. They wanted the one thing that God knew they didn't need. Please don't miss that from Genesis. They wanted the one thing that they didn't need. And it caused them so much trouble. So, Thanking God this morning. This Thanksgiving, I want us to consider this morning four specific ways, and this could have been 400 specific ways. And y'all know me, I'm that long winded. It definitely could have been that many. But this morning, I'm going to share with you four specific things in which the Bible says we should be thankful for. All right? The first one is this. Listen, we should thank God for His love and mercy. Now, those really could have been two, right? But, I mean, can you actually preach about the love of God without mentioning the mercy of God? And can you actually preach about the mercy of God without preaching about the love of God? So we need to be thankful. We need to thank God for His love and His mercy. When I think of the many ways 
Right? And this is, y'all know me, all I know how to preach from is my own faults, my own failures, what God is doing in my life. When I think of the many ways in which I have rejected God in my life, I'm amazed that He continues to still love me. And that He wants a relationship with me. You know, there's, there's the life uh, that I led before coming to Him in 1997. There's the life that I led before coming to Christ. And I understand full well. He was willing to forgive me and to adopt me, as we've been talking about on Sunday nights, uh, adopt because of His grace, to adopt me as His child when I gave my life to Jesus. I'm fully aware of that. Complete forgiveness of all those things that I've done. But the sad truth is even after I have come into a relationship with Him, I still recognize that many of my actions... Many of my thoughts, many of my attitudes, many of my, did I say actions, <laughs> have been very much displeasing to me. Have been very much displeasing to him. Dare I say, heartbreaking to him. And yet he still offers me his love and his mercy. You know, I understand we live in a very egotistical world today where everybody thinks it's all about them and they can all have whatever they want when they want it. Nobody asks permission. Everybody just does, right? It's, it's, we're living in the most ego, egomaniac kind of time, right, that we've ever lived in. But we need to understand that we don't deserve that love. We don't deserve that mercy. We need to be thankful. You see what I've come to understand in, in, in my, my life and my own life and in, oops, sorry, keep picking up it. My own life and in the life of others, working with teenagers, working, you know, helping with some sports teams and being around young people, is a lot of people aren't thankful for much. Because they think they deserve it. And that's where that's where it all boils down from, right? The things in our life that we're not thankful for, if we sit back and just look at it, we think, well, I deserve that. I deserve this right. I deserve this. My, uh, my, my parents, you know, it, we have a lot of uh, generation, not our kids, right? Our kids are all perfect. But the other kids, it, we have this generation where we're raising them up, where, where they're disrespectful to their parents, where they talk back, or, 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 or they, they act out. And we wonder why they do that. But they do that because they're not thankful for much of anything. They think they deserve it. I see it in my life. I see it in my children's life. Right? I see it in your life. I see it in some of your kids' lives. I see it in our church life. Right? We take this church for granted. I mean, we have this idea somehow that we just deserve it. We just deserve it. And we're somehow or another, we just deserve it. We can take it as we want it. We can come when we want. We can maybe volunteer, maybe not. We can play a part, we may not. You know, we just, you know, if, if we deserve for it to be there when we need it, whether we put anything into it or not. So how in the world are we not thankful for our church? I mean, when's the last time you really were just thankful? For this church. Instead of running it down, running, running your mouth about it, dogging the preacher, dogging the deacons, talking about all the things that are wrong. And we are, we're a living organization of people that are flawed. So absolutely, there's things that are wrong. Amen. You got me as a leader, there's going to be plenty wrong. But when's the last time you were just thankful for what you do have instead of worrying about all you don't have? When's the last time? You see, we need to be thanking God for His. For his love and his mercy. Because we do so much that we displease him in. And yet he still gives us those things. He still offers me these things. In Max Mercado's book, The Gentle Thunder, he said, There are many reasons God saves you. To bring glory to himself. To appease his justice. To demonstrate his sovereignty. But one of the sweetest reasons that God saves you is because he loves you. Anybody ever created anything that you didn't love? I got three kids that sometimes I don't like. <laughs> but I love them. No matter what. With, they're a part of me. God loves us. Nice to Kato went also to write in that same statement. I'm going to skip some of it, but at the end he says, 
Never forget that God can live anywhere in the universe, and yet he chose to live in your home. He loves you. He loves you. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 says, For God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. That phrase, rich in mercy, is a powerful one. Because God is rich in every possible way. Psalms 50, 10, 11 reminds us, For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills, uh, and, and all that moves in the field is mine. God owns everything. And yet, from our standpoint, you better believe the most valuable thing that God can offer us is not wealth, is not homes, is not a cattle on a thousand hills. The greatest thing that God can offer us, the most valuable thing that God can offer us, is His mercy. Because we don't deserve it. We, we don't deserve it. There's nothing about us on our best day that deserves the mercy that He pours out on us. And that, and that mercy is a result of another great trait, which again is God's love. Because God loves us, He offers us His mercy. Every single one of us have rejected God in so many ways, yet He still offers to forgive us and bring us into His family. And I know that's a hard statement for some of you, because some of you won't take ownership of that. For some reason, you think you're above that. But trust me, you reject Him in so many ways. In so many priorities. And in so many choices. And yet He still forgives us. And brings us into our into his family. Understand, your salvation, my salvation is 100% dependent on those facts. 100%. We are saved by his grace. And so today we need to be reminded of thinking for his love and his mercy. Secondly, we need to thank God for his provision. Did everybody that wants breakfast this morning get breakfast? I hope. I thank you. Probably. If you didn't have breakfast, you probably because you, you, you didn't choose to have breakfast. And so guess what? You ought to thank God for it. Uh, I, I know it's the year 2023, but you really shouldn't eat without thanking God for it. And I'm not talking about putting on a show. Right? I'm talking about just in your heart. Right? I used to be that guy. I used to be that guy that thought you, know, you had to pray over everything in public. And uh, my wife and my children would remind me that it's not a sermon, it's a prayer. <laughs> Hurry up, we're hungry. Uh, but uh, but now I just realize it's, just, it's not even. I mean, yeah, sometimes we do pray out loud. Sometimes even out in public, we'll take a second to, to, to pray together. And, and sometimes you'd be amazed at what effect that has on people if they might say something to you. But for the most part, a lot of times it's just a simple, you know, just head bow in my own heart, in my own mind. God, thank you for this frozen pizza. Right? Thank you for this bologna sandwich. It would be better if it smoked bologna, but you know, nobody would give me smoked bologna in a while. So. We need to thank God for his provision. We need to thank God for his provision. Did you have breakfast this morning? Thank God for it. You have clothes? Thank goodness you've all got on clothes that you, get, that you put on. Thank God for those things. Were you able to drive here in a car or at least catch a ride from somebody so you didn't have to walk in this freezing, freezing cold wind? Uh, absolutely. Thank God for it. You have a job or some other means of receiving an income, somebody that takes care of you in some way. Thank God for that. Thank God for it. Everything that we have or own has been given to us by God. And again, I know when you're arrogant, sometimes some of us think, oh no, preacher, it's me. Uh, it's my education. It's my hand. It's my training. It's my skill. Again, remember a while ago when I talked about the egotistical society that we live in? That's usually given away by the words, I and my. Okay. You may have some skills, but they're not yours. You may have some abilities, but it's not yours. It was given to you by God to be a steward of. Everything that you have, every ability that you have, everything that you can do was given to you by God, and we ought to be thankful for it. Philippians chapter 4, 19 says, And God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. 
love that verse, but also every time I read it, I feel like it's necessary to stress that God supplies our needs, not our wants. But most of us probably already understand that. If God gives us everything we want, many of us would end up regretting what we wanted. I'd love to share with the teenagers on Wednesday night. I know I've shared it with you. God gives us everything that we need. God actually gives us the things that we would ask for if we really knew what we needed to be asking. Because God knows what we need. God knows our needs and we can trust Him on that. God is a provider. Look, and at the end of this service, I'm going to give you a chance. If you want to testify to some of these things that we talk about, I'm going to give you a chance to do that. But I want to share with you a story. I, I, I don't read as much as I used to uh, because I just can't. But but I I, I love to read. And, and I, I, in one of the books that I love to read, of course, y'all know I, I love Francis Chan. In, in his book, Forgotten God, he gives an illustration of God's providence or God's, I'm sorry, God's provision that I have never been able to get rid of. Okay? I was going to try to tell it to you by, by, by mind, but I, I know I would mess it up. So I'm going to read to you a section of the book, Forgot, Forgotten God, where it's talking about how God just provides. And this is supernatural, and I know some of you are so skeptical, you're going to roll your eyes, and you're going to go, I don't believe it. That's between you and the Lord. Okay? Listen, to, listen to this. When, we, when we're talking about thanking God for His provision. This is going to be something that's really big, okay? But I also hope we don't miss the small. You ready? In the book, Forgotten God, he says, Years ago, Dave Phillips and his wife, Lynn, had talked about the callings they felt God was stirring in them. It is important to understand that, right? This is not part of the book. That as a Christian, there ought to be some times in your life where God is stirring you. If as a child of God, he's not ever stirring you, if he's not ever moving you, if, he's not, if you're not having a battle with him, if you're not having to go with him into some things, uh, you need to get some things right. Because God's always stirring in the life of a Christian. He says, years ago, Dave Phillips and his wife, Lynn, had talked about the callings they felt God was stirring them in. And as they discussed what they were most passionate about, they agreed that bringing relief to suffering children and reaching the next generation with the gospel was at the very top of their list. The thought of starting a relief agency was actually considered. But Dave's response was, that would mean I have to talk in front of people. By nature, Dave was a very quiet, behind-the-scenes man. But after much prayer, Dave set aside his fear, and he and Lynn started what is called the Children's Hunger Fund out of their garage. Six weeks after CHL, as they now call it, was launched in January of, this is back in 1992, he said, I received a call from the director of a cancer treatment center in Honduras asking if there was any way we could obtain a certain drug for seven children that they had who were going to die without this drug. They wrote down the name of the drug and told the director that he had no idea how to get this type of drug. Then they prayed over the phone and asked God to please provide. As Dave hung up the phone, before he could set it down, the phone rang again. It was a pharmaceutical company in New Jersey asking Dave if he would have any use for 48,000 vials of that exact drug. Not the generic, not something close to it, that exact drug. Drug. Not only did they offer him eight million dollars worth of this drug, but they told him they would airlift it any place in the world. So they would, would, would later learn that the company was only only two in the world that manufactured that. I'm sorry, only two in the United States that manufactured that particular drug. So within 48 hours, they've had the drug sent to the treatment center in Honduras and 20 other locations as well. It was then he believed that God was at work validating his call to his ministry. Year after year, God continues to provide supernaturally. Today, they have distributed more than, this was, and this was at the time the Forgotten God was written, which was early 2000s. He said they, they distributed over 950 million in food and other relief in more than 10 million kids in 70 countries and 32 states. 
Children's Hunger Fund has distributed over more than 150 pounds of food and 110 million toys. All right? That's just a story. And that's a big story. Please understand. I know that's a big story. But every one of you have a story. I promise you, okay, even these youngins, that's kids in Kentucky, we call them youngins. Even these youngins have a story. They may not realize it, they may not know it, but they have a story of God's provision. And every single one of you adults in here, some of you godly seniors have a lot more than one. Right, this is a big story. This is the aha story, right? But we all have stories of God's provision. Right? From something as simple as knowing you've got to go somewhere and not having enough gas to get there. But then after church, somebody gives you some money that you didn't realize that you had won in a bowling tournament six months ago. It absolutely fills your car up so you can get to where you need to go. We have those type of stories. We have stories like when your father gives away your supper to somebody that's a transient coming by, driving by the community, and you you literally watch them give away what you, you know your mom said you were going to eat for supper, only to have two hours later somebody pull up with a freezer full of meat. Those are some of my stories. Y'all have those type of stories. Where God provides... But again, sometimes like spoiled children, we forget those things. We forget those things and we, in, in forgetting those things, we lose our thankfulness for his provision. Right? We lose his thankfulness for our provision. How many times do we go, oh, Got to go home and eat. I think there's leftover soup. Man. How many times do we think those type? Got to go to this job. Right? God's provided. God's given you the ability to do. We, we, need, we need to be thankful. So again, I understand. We had time, all of us, to share story after story how God has met the needs of His people. Some might be as big as that. Some of you may have some of those big stories. Some of you might be as small and as simple as mine. It's not an unusual thing. It's the norm. And we need to give thanks to God for those provisions. Thirdly, we need to thank God for His protection. We need to thank God for His protection. Look, while, while if we took the time, we could we could list fears of all kinds of things that we all have, right? Fears of dying too young, right? Fears of living alone, fears of, of somebody hiding under the bed, right? Fears of driving in traffic, fears of, uh, of facing a mean boss, right? Fears of tight spaces, fears of crowds, fears, 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 fears right? We could we could list all kinds of fears. But honestly, I think our greatest fear, if we really think about it, is and ought to be, honestly, living a life with no real purpose. And whether that's the, the real fear or if it's some other fear, the good news is that God will take care of all of those fears. Right in Psalms 27, 1, it says, The Lord is my life and my salvation. Who shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You know, our fears and our insecurities aren't from God. It's just Let me say it again. Our fears and our insecurities are not from God. Thank you. They're not from Him because He will take care of everything. Why would I fear anything? When the God that said, Pluto, go there. Not the Disney Pluto. Planet. The, the God that said, all right, Moses, throw that stick down. And he turned it into a snake. See, if I was Moses, 
the rest of the story when he got written. Because when he said, pick it back up, I went, uh-uh, <laughs> not that snake. Right? And he turned it back into a staff. Part of the Red Sea, water in the rock, <coughs> honey in the rock. And I know how I just eat up with that song. I have all that I need. And I just sat in my office and cried as I listened to how ungrateful I really am and understanding how much God has provided. Man on the ground. Huh? If you can't ever see the correlation between the children of Israel and Baptists, you're never going to see it if you don't read that story and see it. They had all that they needed and they were unthankful. Ungrateful. Bread wasn't enough, they wanted some chicken. <laughs> Listen, we have, he, he gives all that we need, and he takes care of all the fears that we have. I don't remember who said it, because again, I, I can't remember things like I want to. But it was basically this, this statement. The only fears that you have are the fears that you want to have. The only fears that you have are the fears that you want to have. Because, bam, God's word says, perfect love casts out fear. And God loves you perfectly. So the only fear this fathead country preacher has are the fears that he chooses to hang on to. The only fears that you beautiful, lovely people have this morning are the fears that you are choosing to keep. We should be thankful for the fact of God's protection. When we consider that the Lord is the light of my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When we consider these words, we have to ask ourselves similar questions. If I, if I have God on my side, what do I have to be? What could I possibly be afraid of? What is the worst thing that could possibly happen to me? And there's a lot of bad things. And we have some people right now in our church family that are going through some bad stuff. I'm not making light of it. But I'm telling you, you don't have to fear it. And furthermore, I'll even be so bold to tell you, you shouldn't be fearing it. Because God has the protection that you need. You've heard me say it again in the 10 years of being a pastor. You've heard me say it a thousand times. Most of us think that the worst thing that's ever going to happen to us is death. And it's honestly the best thing that's ever going to happen to us. Mm-hmm. I do have some fears. Transparency. I have a lot of fears of inadequacy and some other things that I hold on to. It's not God. Again, I choose to hold on to them. I'm perfectly well and I'm reaching to myself. But I promise you, I do not have a fear of death. Say, preach that on my sin. I'm telling you, I do not have a fear of death. I'm not going to stand in the middle of the road and tell man to run over me with his truck. <clears throat> right? I'm not going to go out go out hunt with Russ and say, hey, Russ, you know what? I'm just tired. End it for me. I'm not going to do that. Right? I'm not, I, I don't, when it, whenever it does happen, hallelujah. Honestly, hallelujah. And, but yet, again, and I'm not making a lot of you, please understand, I'm not making fun of you. I just want you, I think God wants you to grasp this idea. Some of you right now, that is the biggest fear that you have, is that you're going to die. And in the life of a Christian, that fear ought not exist. Because God offers you protection. <clears throat> well, there are legitimate and understandable fears. There are nothing in light of the fact that God offers us his protection. God offers us his embrace. God offers us his peace. God offers us his strength. We are grateful to God, or we ought to be grateful to God, that he is watching over us every minute of the day. We should be thankful for his protection. Lastly, we should be thankful for God's guidance. We should be thankful for God's guidance. Many people pray. 
Right? Many people pray and ask to hear from God. I'm, I'm guilty of this. Right? I'm guilty of this. Through our, through our struggle as a church to find a worship leader, through our struggle as a church looking for youth leaders, through our struggles as a church for other things that are going on around us that uh, most of you from H probably don't know, you're not, you don't know. Man, I struggle sometimes going, God, just, I know you've got the answer. I know you've got the plan. But can I just please hear it? <laughs> can I please just hear it? Can you show me? I won't tell you. I promise I won't tell Gary nothing. He can't keep a secret anyway. Or if I do tell him, I'll make sure he's hearing they're off so he don't hear me. I promise I won't tell anybody. You just let me know what you're doing and why it's taking so long. Guilty. Guilty. We all pray and ask God to hear His voice and to hear from Him. We're always wanting to hear an audible voice. But the truth of the matter is God has given us a very clear roadmap for living and it's found in His Word. And while they might not ask, actually give me the right answer for when or how or whatever the worship leader is going to take place, it gives me everything that I need to go through this season of us not having it. Amen? It's a roadmap for living in this world, and we find it in His Word. The 66 books of the Bible offer us guidance on almost every conceivable issue that we could ever deal with. I've shared it, a lot of you have shared it on social media, right? That, that meme where God's on his, on his hands, he's praying, Oh Lord God, let me hear your voice. And all of a sudden you see a hand come down out of the fire of the cloud and it's holding the Bible. It really is. It really is. that easy to understand. We need to thank God for the guidance that we get from him, from his word. Look, and I could go on and talk about the guidance that we get from the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us, but God didn't leave you there today. Thank God for His guidance. Psalm 119, 105, one of my life verses. It says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Bible is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path because it shows us the way that we should go. It is a guide for our lives and it is essential for our spiritual growth. I get tickled, right? I get tickled. People have left this church. People leave other churches to come to this church and they'll go, well, I, I just wasn't growing where I was at. I just wasn't growing where I was at. Was you reading God's word? Right. It's like dying of hunger and blaming the commons. Feed yourself. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a, God, a, a light to my path. It's there to guide us, and we should be thankful for this guidance. There's nothing that we'll go through that's not there for our spiritual growth and for our spiritual maturity. There are, there are and again, I understand some of you go, oh, I, I, I struggle reading the Bible. I just preach I just can't read it. Listen, I, I'm not, I'm not the King James only person. We are, we should be so thankful. We have so many different interpretations and translations. Okay, I can't read Greek or Hebrew, so i got to trust those. Huh? I'm telling you, no matter how much you struggle to read, you can find a translation that you can read. It's a, it's a poor excuse for not reading God's Word. You say, well, preacher, I can't read it all. I got third grade education or second grade education. I got no education. I can't read it all. Well, I got good news for you as well. There's plenty of audio recordings of God's Word where you can listen to the silky smooth voice of James Earl Jones. <laughs> Greeting to you from Genesis. Right. There's audio recordings of it. And, and who knows? If you open it up and you listen and you look, God may just teach you to read as you listen and as you look. But there's audio recordings. And there's videos that you can watch. There are all, so many different resources available to help you understand it better. Some people like to study the Bible chronologically, while others prefer to study specific topics. No matter what method you choose, make sure that you are just consistent in your studies and that you set aside enough time each day to really focus on 
what you're reading. Right. Again, I like devotions, so please don't say I'm saying something that I'm not. I read a lot of devotions. Uh, I do devotions through Full Count Ministry. I do full devotions. Oh, Adrian Rogers sends one out every day and a bunch of other preachers. I love to read devotions. But I would not be much of a preacher if all the Bible reading that I ever got was through my daily devotions from other people. Not that they're not valuable. Does that make sense? I would dare say that you would not want me as your pastor if that's all the Bible study that I was getting. Was my six, seven, or even eight daily devotions. Why don't you demand the same thing from yourself? Right, if you would demand it from your pastor, why would you not demand it from yourself? To spend time, to take time in the most valuable thing that God has given us outside of our salvation. It's the book of instructions on how to live for Him. How to follow Him. How to find contentment in Him. How to find joy in Him. How to find peace in Him. How to find all the things that we need in Him. I told you it's a, it's a life verse. Your word is a lamp into my feet, a light into my path. It's a life verse in my life because I learned all the days of struggling, all the days of tripping, all the days of getting lost, all the days of failing, all the days of falling. Or because of the days I wasn't making it a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The periods in my life where I really sin struggle. Lack of God's word. There's times in my life where my faith was shaken. My where, where doubts were my master. A lack of God's word. And I know that you can I mean I I don't know your life. I don't, I don't have cameras in your house. But I know you know exactly that this is true. When it is a lamp into your feet and a light into your path, that path is easy. And it say it's easy. Easier. There's lots of examples of lives that weren't easy. But they were doable because they were in God and with God. He was in the midst of it. We need to be thankful. We need to show our thankfulness by using it, right? The Bible is important because it's God's word to us. In it, we find guidance for our lives, answers to our questions. It's also a source of comfort and hope in times of trouble. Additionally, studying the Bible can help us grow closer to God. It helps us deepen our faith. It helps strengthen our walk. When we take the time to understand what God has said, we are better able to apply His truths to our lives and then start to make choices that honor Him. Plain and simple. Make choices that honor Him. And I dare say again, it's a simple truth. When we're making choices that don't honor Him, we can probably look back in our life and see a lack of God's Word in us. When we're making choices that discredit Him, when we're making choices that break His heart, we can probably look back and say, well, yeah, there was a season where I wasn't in the Word. I wasn't in the Word. I wasn't in the Word. I wasn't making the lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It's a guy named Elias Bodon, I think is how you pronounce his last name. He was a lawyer in the state from back in the 1700s. He wrote this. He said, if you were to ask me to recommend the most valuable book in the world, I should fix on the Bible as the most instructive, both to the wise and to the ignorant. Were you to ask me one of 40, the most rational and pleasing entertainment to the inquiring mind, I, would, I should repeat, it is the Bible. It's the most interesting history. I should still urge you to look into your Bible. I would make it, in short, the Alpha and Omega of my knowledge. We have too many things in our life that compete for our time. 
God's word, but should not be competing. Should this was back in the 1700s. And this guy said it's the most important book for those who are smart and those who are dumb. That's my word, not his. It's the most entertaining book. It's the most historical book. It's the book that you need the most of in your life. God is more than willing to guide us. Can I say that again? God is more than willing to guide you, to guide me, to guide us. All we have to do is open up his book and allow him to speak to us. We should thank God for that privilege today. We should thank God for his guidance. So, this morning, love and mercy, provision, protection, guidance. These are just four of thousands and thousands and thousands of reasons why we should give thanks to God. This Thanksgiving, yeah, absolutely, right? It moves it to the forefront. But honestly, it should be our life every single day. It should be our life every single day. When we take time to express our gratitude to God, we are reminded of all the ways that He has blessed us. And we also encourage others in our reminders. And that is a cause for celebration. So as you celebrate Thanksgiving this year, never forget that the one we are most thankful for ought to always be God Himself. And all the provisions, big and small, that He provides for us.